This video is brought to you by Brilliant. Click the link in the description to take advantage of a special offer for Arvin Ash viewers. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. When you kick a soccer ball, the energy you expend in moving your foot is transferred to the movement or kinetic energy of the soccer ball. Some of this energy is also expended in the form of heat and sound, but if you were to add up all the energy from the start to finish, you would find that the total energy did not change. This rule applies to everything. No matter how you transfer or transform energy, kicking a soccer ball, driving a car, lighting a candle, the total amount of energy stays constant overall. The same goes for momentum. When objects collide, their momentum just gets passed around. These are examples of conservation laws in physics, and they're probably the most fundamental principles we know of. But what's even more fascinating is why these laws hold true. Turns out that each conservation law is tied to a deep symmetry in nature. This connection was first uncovered by mathematician Emmy Neuter, and it's one of the most beautiful ideas in physics. If nature's laws have a certain symmetry, then something will be conserved, always. In this video, I'll break down the three major conservation laws and show you why and how they reveal a fundamental symmetry in the universe and how Neuter's genius helped uncover some of the deepest secrets of reality. You don't want to miss this, because that's coming up right now. Let's start with the three major conservation laws. These are the VIPs of physics that never break as long as nothing from the outside interferes. The first is conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created out of nothing nor destroyed to nothingness. It can only change form. For example, chemical energy in fuel turns into kinetic energy of a car, which turns into heat, and so on. But if you add it all up, the total energy stays the same. This rule, the first law of thermodynamics, is absolutely fundamental. The second is conservation of momentum. There's linear and angular. Both are important, but for simplicity, I'll talk about linear momentum. Just know that the same principle applies to the total spin of a system. Momentum is the product of mass times velocity. You can think of it as how much something is moving. Heavier things moving faster have more momentum than lighter things moving slower. In an isolated system, the total momentum remains constant. When playing billiards, for example, when the cue ball hits object balls, its momentum is transferred. If you add it up, the mass times velocity of all the balls before and after the collision, it would remain the same. The third is conservation of electric charge. The total charge of a system remains the same. Charge can be transferred, but not created or destroyed. So for example, in a chemical reaction, when one molecule gains a negative charge due to the transfer of an electron, the other molecule gains a positive charge. Total charge remains the same in an isolated system. You can't create charge out of nothing. These are the big ones energy, momentum, and charge. There are other conservation laws like conservation of lepton number or baryon number in particle physics, or the combined conservation of mass energy, which merges mass and energy together. But the three above are considered the bedrock conservation laws that apply across a huge range of physical phenomena. They were discovered by observing that nothing ever seemed to violate them. No one ever saw energy just pop into existence or disappear, for example. For a long time, they were just how nature works, but that wasn't a fully satisfying answer. It felt like there must be a reason why these quantities are the ones that nature chooses to keep constant. And that's where symmetry enters the story. What is the meaning of symmetry? When we hear symmetry, we think of visual patterns, like a butterfly with matching left and right wings, a perfectly round snowflake, or letters like H and O that look the same in a mirror. In everyday language, symmetry means a change that leaves something looking the same. If you rotate a snowflake, it lines up with itself again. That's rotational symmetry. In physics, we extend this idea to the laws of nature. A symmetry means that when you make a change or a transformation in a system, the governing laws or equations do not change. It's an invariance. For example, Imagine you perform an experiment today and then the exact same experiment tomorrow. If the laws of physics are time symmetric, the results should be identical. That is, the underlying rules don't care when you do the experiment. 
This is a symmetry in time, or time translation symmetry. Likewise, if you do an experiment in New York City and then do the same thing in Beijing, you will get the same outcome if conditions are the same. This tells us that the laws of physics are symmetric in space. They don't care where you are. No particular location in the universe has special physics. That's spatial or space translation symmetry. Just like a mirror image or a rotated shape can be invariant in appearance, a physical process can be invariant in its outcomes under a shift in time or space. Physicists and mathematicians say the system is invariant under that transformation. But here's the key insight that was proven by Emmy Neuter around 1918. Whenever you have such a symmetry, something must be conserved. It's now called Neuter's theorem. Stated informally, the theorem says, for every continuous symmetry of a physical system, there's a corresponding conserved quantity. So what properties are conserved with time and space translation symmetry? Time translation symmetry leads to conservation of energy, and space translation symmetry leads to conservation of momentum. Similarly, something called gauge symmetry leads to conservation of electric charge. This is a more complicated concept, but I will add this as a bonus at the end of the video if you really want to dive into the nitty-gritty of quantum physics. Let me first address the question I posed in the title of this video by thoroughly explaining how time translation symmetry leads to energy conservation. Then I'll explain the other two conserved quantities. First, you should know that energy is a kind of currency in the universe. It can make things move, heat things up, create light, or even hold things together. Energy can switch forms from motion to heat, like the brakes in your car, from electricity to sound, like the speakers in your headphones, but it can't disappear or appear out of nowhere. But imagine if this was not the case. Imagine what it would mean if energy was not conserved, if energy suddenly appeared out of nowhere. It would mean there was a special moment in time when extra energy was created, breaking the idea that the rules of the universe are constant over time. If energy suddenly disappeared, again, there would be a special moment in time where the rules changed. In other words, changing energy would mean the universe has special moments where the rules shift, making things different today than yesterday. But since we see that the universe's rules don't change from moment to moment, that is, we have time symmetry, the universe can't have these special moments when energy suddenly appears or disappears. In other words, if the rules stay the same, the universe has no way to choose or suddenly find a special moment in time to add or remove energy. If energy appeared or disappeared, that would mean the universe was different at one moment compared to another. But because the universe is symmetrical in time, energy must remain constant to keep the symmetry true. Emmy Neuter proved this mathematically, that time symmetry leads directly to the universe conserving energy. Now I'm going to address the other two conserved quantities and how they lead to conservation of momentum and electric charge. As I said earlier, space translation symmetry means that the laws of physics are the same in New York as they are in Beijing, as they are in your house. They are the same in the Milky Way galaxy as they are in the Andromeda galaxy. For illustration, let's use an example of two people in a boat on still waters. If one throws a basketball to the other, what happens? The momentum of the basketball is transferred to the movement of the two boats. They both move away from each other. If we did calculations, we would find that the total momentum of the basketball was transferred to the boats. There is some friction of the water in the real world, which we're going to ignore for simplicity. But imagine if this were not the case. What if momentum was not conserved? What if suddenly the momentum changed for no reason? Like one of the boats started moving with no push of any kind. This would mean that something changed in the laws of the universe depending on where the boats are located in the water. But space translation symmetry says that the rules can't depend on your position. The rules are the same whether you are here or three meters away. In other words, if momentum were not conserved, it would break the space translation symmetry. It would imply that there's a special place in the universe where momentum can appear or go away. But translation symmetry forbids this. Therefore, momentum must stay constant. Very similarly, rotational symmetry leads to conservation of angular momentum as well. Now let's look at gauge symmetry, 
leading to the conservation of charge. This one is a bit more abstract, so I'll start with a simple analogy, and then we'll go deeper. What's your height? Let's say you tell me that you are 5 feet 8 inches tall. What is the zero height? Are you measuring this height from the floor of your house? Are you measuring it from sea level? Or are you measuring it from the center of the earth? If you measure your height from the floor of your house, it would be a different number than if you measured it from sea level, and much different than the number from the center of the earth. But changing the place you call zero height doesn't actually change how tall you really are, does it? You just chose a different reference for what you call zero height. This choice of starting point is what scientists call gauge choice. Let's take this analogy into the physics of electricity. In electricity, instead of height, we measure something called potential. It's kind of like the electric height for charges. Charges move from higher electric potential to lower ones, just like water flows downhill. But just like the height example, the place you choose as zero electric potential is up to you. You can choose any reference point you want. You could choose the negative side of a battery as zero, or you could choose the positive side of a battery as zero. When you change the zero point, the number for potential will be shifted everywhere in the universe. But even though the numbers have changed, the behavior of charges and electricity will remain exactly the same. This flexibility to choose the zero point for electric potential without affecting real physics is what we call gauge symmetry. Now, how does this freedom to choose your reference, the gauge symmetry, lead to electric charge conservation? Here's how. Gauge symmetry says you can shift your potential, your zero point, however you want, and nothing physically real changes. If this were not the case, it would mean that electric charge could just appear or vanish randomly, and the electric field patterns would change unpredictably. That means suddenly your choice of zero point would matter. It would affect reality, breaking gauge symmetry. But gauge symmetry is fundamental. It's built into how electric and magnetic fields work. Nature never breaks this symmetry. So, electric charges can't simply appear or disappear randomly. The total amount must always remain constant. And this is called conservation of charge. In other words, gauge symmetry forces charges to behave in a consistent, predictable way, never popping in or out of existence. Charges can move around, but the universe's total charge stays constant. Your choice of zero point for potential doesn't change real physical events. In each of these cases, Noether's theorem elevates what once were just observed facts to something deeper, a logical consequence of symmetry. Before Noether, conservation laws were kind of mysterious random principles confirmed by experiments but never explained. After Noether, we understand that they are demanded by certain symmetries, so we can understand where they come from at a fundamental level. No wonder Einstein praised her as the most significant creative mathematical genius. And if you want to be a mathematical genius too, a great start to your journey would be at Brilliant.org, our sponsor today, where they have a wonderful learning path called Foundational Math. I love the Brilliant app because it builds the foundation in math and science through hands-on problem solving, then guides learners through increasingly challenging in-depth problems to reach real learning goals. This method works best for me, but it's also proven to be six times more effective than watching lectures you'll develop an intuition for math through visual, interactive, hands-on problem solving. You'll learn to think like a mathematician, or maybe even an engineer, like me. But Brilliant will also help you become a better thinker and problem solver with thousands of visual, interactive lessons in not only math, but also science, programming, data analysis, and AI. Goal-oriented learning will be right at your fingertips, whether at home or on the go. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash arvinash Scan the QR code on screen or click the link in the description. Bullion also has given our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. I encourage you to give it a try. And if you love the subject of quantum fields, here is one of our most popular videos that explains it in simple terms. I'll see you in the next video, my friend.